98 Not Out, sponsored by Shepherd Neen, proud supporters of cricket in Essex. Now, um, our first guest of the evening is uh, just joining us now online. Um, please welcome to 98 Not Out, ex-Middlesex and England star, now head coach at uh, the University of the West Indies in Barbados, Mr. Roland Butcher. Roland, how are you? Uh, good afternoon to you. I'm doing very well, sir. How is Barbados at the moment? You're, you're sort of out of lockdown there, aren't you? Um, yeah, very much so. Um, even though a little bit of concern of late in the last week or so, there have been quite a number of positive tests, mainly from persons returning. Um, now the flights have started to come back mm -hmm. also. A lot of positive tests have come in. People who obviously were stuck overseas and couldn't get back, so... Um, the last week or so um, there has been quite a, a spike in that and just really having to keep a, a close watch on it. You're getting visitors returning now as well. I've seen Wayne Rooney and his family are out there at the moment. Yeah, yeah. Visitors, <laughs> you know, I guess they've been pent up for three or four months and some people want to just get away and perhaps get to somewhere that hasn't been too badly affected yeah I was I was supposed to be there in July I come every year and uh, we've had to cancel that which is a, a great disappointment to myself and my family who love coming over and spending summer time in Barbados yes it, also this this is the time that my daughter and granddaughter usually comes as well but that's had to be put on hold yeah it's nice because usually it's a peaceful time on the island it's not it's not too busy so um, we enjoy coming and then it shuts down for September normally doesn't it absolutely so um, let's take you back. So as a, a young 13-year-old, you arrived in England and uh, you began a cricketing career. Um, Middlesex, was it straight away Middlesex? Were you playing at clubs in, when, you, when you first started playing cricket in England? Yeah, when I eventually got back into cricket, it really started with Stevenage Cricket Club in Hertfordshire. Uh -huh. um, you know, I, I managed to play a third 11 game really by accident um, our usual weekend was just really spent playing football in the morning a whole bunch of kids getting together and you know playing their own brand of football own mm -hmm. rules etc and mm -hmm. just following one training session on Sunday morning we were about to leave when some men just turned up to put some stumps on on the wickets and wandered over to our group and asked if any of us would play because there were a couple of men short so long story short yeah i was i was persuaded against my better judgment to play but i played um took a couple of catches probably got a dozen runs or so but i guess they were either very short or they liked what they saw invited me to play again and very quickly i, I gravitated to the second 11 and, and, and the first 11 also within that first year. So it already started back in Stevenage as a, a Stevenage Cricket Club, uh, playing for their first 11, played for Hertfordshire schools and really my chance came when one of our players in the club, who was also a, um, a big football man by the name of Cyril Hammond, he was um, one of our good cricketers, he was also a manager of Biggles Wade Football Club and he got a position at Gloucestershire County Cricket Club as, as um, chief fundraiser and having arrived at the club he recommended me as a, as a young talented player that they should look at and I was invited down to play in their youth team and I did that for a couple of summers uh, and then eventually ended up at Lords and the MCC Young Professional Staff in 1970. So that's really, that was the route for me. That was quite a Middlesex team back in those days. Um, and I've noticed, just sort of doing a bit of research, that um, what stood out for me um, was that you were one of five black players in that Middlesex team, which, um, when you compare to the current issues about the lack of involvement from black kids in the UK in cricket, um, but it seemed to be a totally different story back then with Middlesex. And uh, I don't think it was so much of an issue that uh, the five of you were black guys. It was just that you were good players. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't think back then there was any real issue, I guess. Maybe Middlesex were a club ahead of their time because, you know, it's a long time ago actually when that happened. And yes, at times I played when there were actually five in the team, five black players in the team, which was... a a good representation so 
I don't think we had any difficulty in relation to that. And obviously, since then, you know, there have been a proliferation of of black players at Middlesex, and you know, and as I said, no problem whatsoever. Now you got your test debut. That must have been uh, an interesting experience for you. You were finally given a cap by England and taken on quite a, a, a lively tour of the West Indies. And um, you made your debut against Messrs Holding, Garner, Croft, Roberts at uh, the Kensington Oval in Bridgetown, Barbados, of all places. How did that feel? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, there's always going to be a tall order. Um, as you know, during that 1980s period, West Indies were extremely dominant, not just um, against England. I mean, they were dominant in world cricket. They were the number one side with fantastic bowling lineup, um, fantastic batting lineup, and, uh, and it seemed that they also caught everything that came their way as well. So you were up against a high-class side. Um, so we were under no illusions the task that we had, and obviously the task for me was going to be even greater because um, here was a, a West Indian coming back to play against West Indies. So yeah, it was something we all looked forward to, and I think at the end of the series uh, you would perhaps feel that we didn't do too badly. The series was lost 2-0, but mm -hmm. I think generally the performances of the England team was pretty good, and uh, we had some three or four very outstanding performances in, in, in various tests. So, you know, it was a great opportunity. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it, obviously, to have made my debut in Barbados, uh, place of my birth, in front of family and friends. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it was a great achievement, just slightly marred by the passing of her assistant manager, Ken Barrington, who oh, yeah, that's right. yeah. had a heart attack on the second day, but I think genuinely it was a very um, happy occasion. What was it like facing them then? You know, not many people got, well, not many people got to play at international level and face them. How difficult was that as a batsman? Well, I mean, it's extremely difficult, and you would expect the difficulty where there's five, you know, outstanding fast bowlers. I mean, you, you know, Malcolm Marshall was in that group as well, so <laughs> he was the fifth one. So it was always going to be difficult. Um, I don't think anybody had any illusions about the challenge. Um, you know, and it, it, it's a case that, you know, generally uh, in cricket, most teams would have two outstanding fast bowlers and um, then they'll have some backup bowlers, so there's a bit of respite. Obviously against the West Indies at that time, there was no respite because when Holden and Roberts came off, um, it was then Croft in Ghana <laughs> and then back to the other two, so you knew, you knew what you were in for all the time. <laughs> There was always a criticism of that team that, um, uh, and Ian Botham tells his story that uh, oh, they couldn't have been world class because they didn't have a spinner. But his uh, his response <laughs> to that would have been, where, where would they have played in? Why did they need a spinner with that attack? <laughs> well, exactly. I mean, um, there was there were not enough overs left for a spinner. <laughs> now, talking of um, Bajans that uh, have gone on to play for England, uh, let's bring it up to date. And uh, you know, your story is slightly reminiscent um, uh, of Joffre Archer in that. Um, you know, being born in Barbados, but uh, but playing Test cricket for England. But your stories are slightly different, um, and the circumstances are, are different. And um, do you do you feel it's a case of the West Indies letting? Because Jofra played for the under-19 West Indian side, uh, and um, ended up playing for England. Do you think that was a case of the West Indies missing a chance, or just opportunities were better in England? How, how do you feel about that? Um, I think very much uh, missing a chance. I mean, he he really wanted to play cricket in the West Indies. And, you know, his move really to England was taking advantage of the fact that he's got a British passport and he believed that he was getting limited opportunities in this region. I guess the crux of that matter was the fact when he was not selected in this team for the Under-19 World Cup, having been the outstanding fast bowler in the regional tournament, which is usually the tournament that they choose the players from to represent the under-19. Um, so they actually pick a group of players, then they have some trial matches, and obviously, as the outstanding fast bowler, you know, he, he felt he had a chance. In the, in the trial matches, I mean, he didn't do, you know, as well as he would like, but I think the fact, you know, really somebody should have thought, well, there is a talent here, and you know, we need to have him in the side. So I think he got fairly upset about that. Then a year or two later, he had a, 
some back injuries which kept him out of the game for a while and I think eventually once he was on the men he, he really decided that you know he's got a British passport so he will cash in and I think he was also assisted in that manner by his good friend um, Christopher Jordan who oh, yeah. obviously yeah. has made a very good name for himself at Sussex and obviously has a lot of influence so you know Chris was very instrumental in assisting him to be at Sussex. Roland, I've, you're coaching in the West Indies now. How difficult is it for you to get um, young West Indian kids to come and actually want to play cricket and go to the highest level? Because, you know, they see the American sports, they see the money involved in that, they see football, the money involved in that. Right, the sounds with Joffre Archer, it sounds like money is a big orientation there because obviously we know the West Indies board are a bit short of money. It, 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 does it need more money coming into the game to get more youngsters coming through? I don't think to get more youngsters coming through. I mean, there is no shortage of youngsters playing the, the game. I mean, you know, Barbados, the other islands, they have got plenty of youngsters playing um, cricket right through to under-19 um, level. I think that our biggest problem in the Caribbean really starts from that period after under-19 because after under-19, you know, there is no regional tournaments, hence the territories don't have a team after that. The only team they have then is the senior national team. And it's almost impossible these days for someone who's just played in the under-19 to force his way into the, the team of a, of a, of a franchise, because they franchises these days with players on professional contracts. So extremely difficult for that person to get in. So, so the problem really lies in the, in the structure which allows, on an annual basis, you know, over 100 under-19 players really to leave the system and go into club cricket, which is, you know, has no infrastructure to develop players for the first-class game. So that's a gap that needs to be closed in the Caribbean. Um, in Barbados, you know, we have started to deal with that. Um, I'm a director of the Barbados Cricket Association. I am also the, the chairman of the Everton Week Centre of Excellence, which... You know, up to now, we had on the 13, on the 15, on the 17, on the 19 um, female team within the Centre of Excellence. Um, having recognised what I was talking about, you know, I managed to persuade my board to have an under 23 A team in our system so that we keep those guys who are just coming out of the under 19 tournament. So we keep them in the system for another three, four years to give them a chance of really pushing to get into the first team. Now, that has to happen around the region. Once that happens, you know, then you have got, you're capturing those best from the 19 players, you're not losing them out of the game. Right now we're losing them, but you're keeping them in the game. So, uh, your question, no problem at all in terms of American sports because in terms of successful um, American sports for West Indians, there are not many options. I mean, athletics is probably an area where, you know, people have scholarships, etc. But that is more for uh, an education than um, a profession. And basketball, obviously, world basketball is a hugely desirable sport for people to play recreationally. You know, generally West Indians are too small um, for that sport. So there's very little chance of a professional career in that. But there are enough kids out there to satisfy um, the cricket public and, and the teams. Do you think the English counties should be doing more to encourage promising players of 19, 20 years old to come over and do a summer playing for a county in the way that you did when you were a youngster? Would that help? I think, yeah, I mean, I, I think one of the things that can happen, and, you know, is to relax the, the rules governing um, the managed migration process because over the last couple of years, the managed migration process has closed really all avenues for not just West Indians, but for any club cricketer or somebody who want to come and play club rugby or whatever to come mm. and even play um, as an amateur. Because as you know in the past, you know, West Indies were successful because in addition to having um, a full international team, you know, playing county cricket, etc., the next group of players were playing in the Lancashire League, in the Yorkshire Leagues, etc., etc. Now, 
those options are no longer available. I mean, even your local club now cannot even sign That's right. um, a young player to come and play. You know, the rules are such now that in order to play club cricket, you know, you have to get a per you, you 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 have to get a work permit, and in order to get a work permit, it means that you have to be a current national player, and would have played five first class matches in the last year. Now, how many people is going to be yeah. in that position? None at all. And the other the other ironical thing about it is that they have a situation now where that something called being on a pathway to being a professional. So if you represented Barbados on the 15, and you never played for Barbados after that, and you are now age 21, you are still deemed to be on the pathway to a professional. And, and the only way you can play is the same status as a professional. You mm -hmm. can't even come and play as an amateur. Yeah. So those are the rules that really need to be relaxed and um, but that's a, that's a situation for the Foreign Office, which is, I think, hindering not just cricket, but it's hindering all sports um, in England in terms of overseas participation. Um, what do you think about um, Jason Holder's comments that, um, I mean, it was a fantastic thing for the West Indies to come over to play England recently, and uh, everyone's grateful that they made uh, such a big uh, effort to come. But Jason Holder's comments about England getting back to tour the Caribbean by the end of this year. Um, I know that when England told the West Indies, it's a big money spinner for, for, for all of the countries involved, but I would like to see tours maybe of the old style nature where they're there for a couple of months, like when you went in 1980 and you play um, Ireland games in between test matches, but is the West Indies in a position to offer that kind of thing to um, someone like England with the, with the background of COVID still going on? Well, I mean, the, you know, the return to how it was before is a desirable thing, but as it stands, the Future Tours, you know, there's a Future Tours program. Um, and really, the problem with the Future Tours program is really the, the distribution of funds because in, in relation to the Future Tours program, the team that plays at home keeps all the revenue. So, you know, you play in England, you play in Australia, you get huge crowds, you get lots of broadcast rights, etc. They keep all the money. Now, mm -hmm. when you come and play in the Caribbean, you know, the maximum crowd you'll ever get probably is in Trinidad, which is 15,000. Yeah. And they're paying, you know, five US dollars. You know, you, you can do the mass. There, yeah. There is... There's, there's a hundred no pound a ticket to, here, yeah. Yeah, there's no, money to be, there's no money to be made. So what needs to happen, first of all, is really the future tourist program has to be, has to be changed to somewhat... Um, and go back to the old days where you negotiated with um, the country that you were going to. They were, you entered into negotiations and then um, you were given what you negotiated. And so you got something out of the tour as well as the home team. Mm -hmm. So this system really is very unfair. The other problem that like West Indies and um, Zimbabwe and some of the smaller countries have is that the distribution of ICC funds is done in such a way that they're disadvantaged. You know, ICC, as you know, ICC funding comes from T20 World Cup, the World Cup, yep. Champions League, um, which are global events. And what they actually do is they pool all the team's rights and sell, sell the rights on the basis of everyone. But when it comes to the distribution, this is where the problem lies, because if you take the, the next um, period of ICC funding, which is I think 2016 to, uh, or 2018 to 2023, out of the funding, India will receive $409 million. <laughs> ECB will get 139. Um, the rest will get 128. And then obviously Zimbabwe will bring up the rear at 94. Now that cannot be a fair system because all that guarantees is that you're going to have three very strong teams yeah. in world cricket and the rest are going to be absolutely struggling and you know the Caribbean is a very expensive place to, to do anything yeah not just to run cricket so that needs to be changed and until such time as that is changed which I don't see it happening in, in any time soon because uh, you know really the ACC is afraid of India in, the, in their rules the roost um, you know you know India now the IPL now 
you know the APL is going to be played in the UAU and they've yeah. put on another women's tournament which is affecting the Australian women's um, big bash so they have got problems to be solved but until they solve it expect West Indies and those other teams to occasionally play well but generally they're going to struggle because they just will not have the um, finance um, to, to, to do any better well. Is uh, it's something we've covered on the show with uh, we, we, we had Jared Kimber's um, death of a gentleman. We hi- it's been highlighted in that, and uh, one of our people, Jyoti Bird, has um, written a piece as well as writing a piece uh, to cover it. And it, it is it is down to India mainly, isn't it? It really is the Indians that need to make the call that they want to benefit the whole of uh, world cricket now. Yes, they need to do that. But I mean, you know, it's India who really fought for this particular position because. India's stance was that out of all the ICC revenues that they were bringing in 80% or the rest of the world were bringing in 20%, so mm. they, they yeah. wanted a bigger share. Now, if you look at the system of the NFL in, in USA, um, they do the same thing in terms of selling the rights on behalf of all 32 teams. But where they differ from the ICC is that they distribute the funds equally to all 32 teams, which means that each team has the wherewithal to now invest um, in their team. So you will get far, you know, most of the teams are going to be good teams because, you know, they're on the same footing. The other advantage that India has in their favor is that, you know, the IPL, and when the IPL is on, you know, there's, there's none or very little international cricket being played around the world because they allow India to do that. Out of that, India will get India get on average four seventy two million US dollars per year. Out of that, yeah, for themselves, the ACC gets nothing, and the the only countries that get anything out of that is if you have players. If you say, for instance, Barbados had two players in the IPL, there's something called release fees, which they will pay the, the West Indies. Um, a percentage in release fees, but then the West Indies board would have to split that between themselves, between the Barbados Cricket Association, which would be the Barbados Players yeah. Association, and the local club that developed the player. So it split three ways. So at the end of the day, there's there's no money really. No. And that is, that is the only thing that IPL does around the world. Yeah. So the, you know, Not right now. Good. You know, it, it, is, it is hugely unfair to the other teams. It's going to be a hell of a mountain to climb to change it as well. I mean, there's a lot of people talking about this, uh, and it seems to be a real concern in the, the world of cricket, and as, as you say, you know, across a wider spectrum as well. I just don't see, and, and you make the point correctly, that, you know, India wanted this situation, so it's going to be very hard for them to, um, to try and sort of... Uh, Give way on it. Um, yeah, I, I, you're absolutely right. I think I think they're, they're not going to want to give way um, in relation to the issue. But w- w- what I think can be a first step is a revision of the future tours. Because yeah. if you had a revision of the future tours, which meant that the the rear team were able to benefit somehow from, say, West Indies playing in Australia, that you benefited somehow from that, and Australia didn't take everything. I think that would be a start, yeah. And it would give those teams more money, you know, to 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 run their affairs. Um, but you can't have that and no. the current yeah. distribution system. So. Roland, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you this evening or this afternoon, uh, in your case, uh, on ninety eight not out. Um, we wish you very, very well uh, and continued success with the University of the West Indies. A lot of talent out there, both academically and uh, on the sports field as well, I know. Uh, and uh, go outside and uh, enjoy some of that wonderful sunshine over there. Well, unfortunately, they can't go outside because I'm not in the test match, so <laughs> <laughs> I will continue to, I'll continue to watch the test match and then maybe I'll venture out after that. <laughs> well, enjoy the game, enjoy the game. Ronan, thanks for your time. Darren, it's been a great pleasure. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Take care. Bye. Take care. Bye.